Welcome, Gerard Petraeus. Good to see you. Good to be back. Thank you very much. So I think John Duke, thanks for the introduction just up front, and thanks uh, for doing this again. As you know, Regida doesn't just interview you, <laughs> she interrogates you. <laughs> That's uh, the drill. But we have agreed that there will be certainly no enhanced interrogation techniques <laughs> uh, beyond that, which I have been against in all seriousness uh, since the beginning. And thanks for uh, remembering my academic and noting that it is rare to have a four-star uh, with a PhD. In fact, I was told that I was committing professional suicide when I went to graduate school uh, and somehow managed to survive. But thank you for reminding me that. Thank you very much, Jenner. It's good to see you. Uh, it has been a couple of weeks since uh, we saw each other, the three of us. The Beirut at... Institute, a must, the best ticket in town. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. And uh, we, much has happened since, and not lots. Much has happened on uh, the Lebanese front, because after I left Abu Dhabi and went to Beirut, and then I found the revolution. I will want to ask you about that at one point, but I think um, uh, your interest, and as everybody else's interest these days, uh, focuses on what's going on uh, with Turkey, with uh, President Erdogan now having had his meeting with uh, the president of Russia, Vladimir Putin, post the interesting development in the American foreign policy towards Syria and Turkish troops in Syria and, and what uh, the Kurds, uh, Kurdish element, you're very familiar with all of that. Do you think that this is understandable, comprehensible? Is it, is it, is it about a mistake that was made or is it really preconceived in order to arrive where we are, where we have really a good relationship between Putin and Erdogan and they're celebrating their victory in Syria? Well, there are some understandable elements of it. Um, there is a very understandable desire on the part of the U.S. president to, quote, end endless wars. Um, nobody appreciates that better than the individual that commanded the wars at their very height, 165,000 American men and women in uniform in Iraq and 100,000 in Afghanistan. Uh, but I also think that I have a reasonable understanding that withdrawing your troops does not necessarily end a war. Um, we heard this phrase in a previous administration. Uh, we were told that the U.S. had ended the war in Iraq. Uh, and I wanted to raise my hand and say, excuse me, what we have done is end our involvement in the war in Iraq. Mm -hmm. We have not ended the war in Iraq. And in lo and behold, the same president who withdrew our forces ostensibly because we could not get a status of forces agreement approved by the parliament, uh, ended up with 5,500 troops on the ground at the end of that administration's time without a parliamentary approved status of forces agreement. Um, my concern uh, in this particular case, and also understanding, to be fair, President Erdogan has some legitimate security concerns about the relationship between the Syrian Kurds we supported, uh, the YPG, and the PKK, the Turkish Kurd terrorist group. It is declared as such, and we have uh, agreed with that, and provided assets. I provided a predator 24 hours a day to Turkey when I was the commander in Iraq during the surge to enable them uh, to more effectively pursue the PKK. So again, that is an understandable it's certainly understandable that Russia and Iran and Bashar al-Assad want to capitalize on our withdrawal. Right. Um, the truth is, though, um, I'm afraid that I share the assessment of the majority leader of the Senate, um, who has declared that this is a grave strategic mistake, uh, and, and that, that is for several reasons, and the reasons that I would give are the following. First, the biggest focus in Syria, of course, has been to ensuring the enduring defeat of the Islamic State. What we have done is actually, and it's very significant in this administration, and frankly the previous administration, can take credit for the elimination of the caliphate noting that, of course, it was not our forces who were do doing the fighting on the front lines. It was Iraqi security forces. Uh, it was Syrian 
uh, democratic forces, the SDF, mostly Syrian Kurds, but also some Syrian Arabs, maybe even some Syrian Christians and Yazidis, but again, predominantly Syrian Kurds. That is a very significant accomplishment. And again, I think it's right that the president should uh, uh, announce that uh, and be proud of that. It is right that the defeat of the Islamic State uh, is a significant achievement. But what we have done is we defeated the Islamic State that was an army, not the Islamic State that is the still in existence 20 to 30,000 uh, insurgents, if you will, or terrorists who are still in the greater Iraq, Syria area, having had their caliphate taken away and had their main forces, their organized forces, uh, largely destroyed. The problem with this is, as we have learned in the past, if you do not keep an eye on terrorists, if you do not keep pressure on them, they can come back. And we saw this most significantly, of course, in Iraq, where the organization Al-Qaeda in Iraq, which we destroyed during the surge, not just defeated, but destroyed, and then kept down even further in the subsequent three, three and a half years, was able to come back when our focus and the Iraqi focus was no longer so significant as the prime minister of that country pursued highly sectarian activities that once more tore the fabric of society, made the Sunni Arabs in Iraq feel alienated and dispossessed after, again, four and a half years of the surge and subsequent where we put them back together. Um, and my fear is, again, that we are taking our eye off the Islamic State because those who have kept that focus on it, the Syrian Kurds, are now understandably concerned about their survival and their family's survival. Many of them, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, have literally been displaced already. They are going to become refugees, uh, and we need to look to their, uh, to their humanitarian needs. We have called into question, I think, because of the suddenness of what we did. It's not the fact that we withdrew or drew down, it's that this was done in such a sudden fashion that the entire world could see that this was a relatively chaotic situation. Yes. Where we are literally loading up as everything we can that is sensitive or explosive, weapons and so forth, communications gear, um, and don't have enough trucks and planes to take it all out. It took us years to build these bases and it cost 10,000 Syrian Kurd lives, more than that, to defeat the Islamic State as we enabled them and advised and assisted them. And we're literally blowing up the very bases that we built uh, as we are pulling out uh, the front door to deny them to, again, either the Turks or more likely the Syrians supported by Russia and, and uh, uh, the Iranians. And, and again, we're allowing Bashar al-Assad to take an area uh, that could not have been taken otherwise. We've denied. The, the bargaining power that control of that area gave to our partners uh, on the ground. Uh, and so this, I think, is a very significant concern. Mm. Uh, and again, it is why I share the assessment of uh, the majority leader and generally the assessment of Senator Graham, although he rightly notes that we could salvage something by keeping some forces uh, in an area that can deny the oil producing areas of Syria uh, to the regime. And if the Syrian Kurds hold that still, they can still get the revenue from that rather than the Islamic State who had it when they, when they controlled it. Or again, Bashar al-Assad, it still gives some uh, bargaining power to those who lost 10,000 lives as we achieved our mutual objective. Let me go through a couple of things because you call this a great strategic mistake. And this is, these are actually the words of the majority leader of the Senate, who right. is, of course, the senior member of our Congress from the same party as our president, and who is pursuing a congressional uh, uh, vehicle that, will con that would force mm. the administration uh, to either back up or, or not withdraw everything from Syria. So this is quite a significant cleavage between the Congress and the White House. Um, and again, I very much agree, though, with that assessment, regrettably. So because, it, again, as the former U.S. Central Command commander of just a few months back wrote, it did not necessarily have to end this way. But uh, 
at least the White House claims that uh, we still have the major air base there, Tanaf in Tanaf, and the oil uh, That's not an areas. air base. That's actually, again, and that's so not that contiguous to northeast. Right. Remember, you have, the, you have the Euphrates River Valley, which goes like this mm -hmm. as you're looking at it. Everything northeast of the Euphrates River uh, in Syria was controlled by the Syrian Democratic Forces, predominantly Syrian Kurds, some Sunni Arabs, some other probably Christian Yazidis. Uh, and then you have down here, separated by quite an expanse, some of which is controlled by the regime, Al Tanf, which is a border crossing mm. uh, between Iraq and Syria. It is, again, very important that that element is, is staying there because that prevents one of the, at least the most direct route from Iran through Iraq, through Syria, and then down into southern Lebanon or to the Golan uh, in support of Hezbollah or Iranian-supported elements in Syria. So let me focus on this point. That's an important point. You think that the policy that uh, the White House or President Trump has maintained that we will not allow Iran to build that passage that you're talking about all the way from Tehran through that area in Syria onto uh, Hezbollah and Lebanon. So is this now weakened or is it still a, a real policy that's being implemented? Can you shed well, some light on that? Sure I can, yeah. Again, keep in mind, you can't keep, I mean, this is a lot of this is trackless desert. Mm. I know this area because of course it's a two star, um, we were responsible for Nainoa province, which is much of it. Uh, including the Jazeera Desert, that it's called, which goes down almost all the way to the Euphrates. Uh, and then as a three-star, we rebuild all the border forts and all this stuff. So I have a real knowledge of this, in addition to obviously my time as the overall force commander in Iraq during the surge. And what we're really talking about here is not trying to deny the open desert route, which you can do if you take a heck of a lot of water and a lot of extra fuel and a lot of extra tires and have a four-wheel drive vehicle. We're talking about preventing a hard surface ground line of communication on which you can take tractor trailer kind of trucks full of equipment, which Iran would like to get all the way into southern Lebanon or at least into west Western Syria to build up more capability and more precision uh, capability, in particular, in direct fire against Israel. Um, there are several crossings that these, Al Tamf is one of those. There's one along the Euphrates, which, you know, you're going through all of the Sunni Arab province of Anbar. And even though there are certainly Iranian supported Shia militia that are in some of these areas, that's not guaranteed. But there is another route that goes up the Tigris and then would go west in Nainoa province out past Talafar and Sinjar, south of Sinjar, or, uh, north of Sinjar Mountain actually, through Ar Rabia is the crossing on the Iraqi side. That was not a concern in the past because to the west of that you had all the area that was controlled by the Syrian Democratic Forces. Right. But now if that area is no longer controlled by them, you could almost start to stitch together a ground line. It's a much longer ground line than going through Al Tom for the Euphrates, but it is not impossible. And if you really want to move very large cargo on the ground, so not having to resort to air, which is exceedingly costly, uh, that may be an option open to them. So that is a concern. So if, if I understand you, bottom line, <clears throat> that policy of withdrawal from Syria has also impacted the claimed policy that Iran will not be permitted to establish is its crossing through Syria uh, to Hezbollah in Lebanon. It has weakened there, it. Where is it? It's not clear to me. Oh, no. This has implications for that, clearly. Okay. Again, there are opportunities that will be available, most likely. Again, we don't know what the final footprint is, and I assume that the Central Command Commander, when he was sitting here, was then unable to, and he maybe couldn't because it still would be options or contingency plans, but having talked to a fair number of senior folks in this great city over the last couple of days, it is not at all clear to me that we have determined what our final footprint inside Syria will be, if any. So, and in fact, Lindsey Graham was, had a statement that I was reading literally on the way here that was advocating such a 
control, again, of the energy producing areas at the least, uh, which would allow us to keep some footprint in Syria, which is what is necessary. You can do a certain amount through the air, but not entirely. You're going to have to have some degree of liaison on the ground, even as you enable the various capabilities in the air. And keep in mind that when you have uh, certain weather events, you cannot necessarily access the capabilities in the air. About the oil fields or the area which is oil producing area, do you think that the administration has in mind to keep control of that endlessly or do you think the Russians have another plan in mind to make sure that this important area is not in the hands of the Americans, as they would refer. Well, it would not be in the hands of the Americans. It would be in the hands of American-supported partners. Who don't trust uh, us much anymore well, since we turn one, around every... Well, this is one reason why, again, so what should you be doing now? Yeah. You should be seeing to the needs of individuals who are now refugees. You should be trying to keep an eye on the Islamic State, ideally through keeping some uh, footprint on the ground that can enable what is in the air. Um, we should be uh, seeking thereby to reassure partners who have been shaken a bit. Uh, be again, it's the suddenness of this. Yeah. And by the way, keep in mind, you understand? Did you know why no one has, decision? no one ever guaranteed the Syrian Kurds their own Kurdish regional government of Syria, similar to what those from Iraq will know to be as the KRG there. There were, however, assurances, and this has been publicly stated recently, again reaffirmed, that the Syrian Kurds were assured that they would have a voice mm -hmm. in the future of northeastern Syria. And that, I think, is the real concern here, that this unfolded so suddenly, uh, so rapidly, that it very clearly was a surprise to our own forces, or they would have withdrawn much more of the activity and not had to blow up our own bases uh, the moment we vacated them. And our Syrian Kurd partners could have had time again to see to the needs of their families and communities and all the rest of this, which clearly the rapid pace of this did not allow. And it uh, also, if you add to it, the relationship, the, uh, the involvement of the relationship with uh, Turkish uh, President Erdogan, all of a sudden, uh, after the withdrawal, Things are going very well between President Trump and President Erdogan. And then not only that, he, that sanctions have been announced to, today to be uh, planned to be lifted. And uh, Mr. Erdogan is invited to Washington. What is What happened? I mean, only yesterday, a couple of months ago, there were threats by members of Congress and even by the administration that if you stay that course, Mr. Erdogan, with your purchase of S-400 from Russia and in, you know trying to infiltrate NATO in the way that you're doing it, you're weakening our structure, you're going to pay for it. There's going to be more sanctions. And all of a sudden, here we are. Not only no sanctions, no talk about that. Well, and in fact, in the lifting of sanctions and saying, sure. bravo Erdogan, go ahead and, you know, get, okay. get the Kurds as well. First of all, keep in mind, it is U.S. law that requires a minimum of five sanctions from a menu of sanctions, again, passed by Congress, signed into law, that if a country buys the S-400 or a system like this, there you have to impose sanctions. There's no... Uh, elimination of that law, if you will. There's been no legislative action uh, to change the law. So that law is still in force and will require the administration still to impose five sanctions from this list. Now, you, there are what might be termed less harsh sanctions and very harsh sanctions. Um, certainly there is a sense, I guess, of relief in the administration that Turkey has not plunged further into Syria. But keep in mind what has now been agreed is about a 20 mile yes. buffer zone, which is quite a considerable distance if you think about it, times about a 250 plus mile border. Do that math, that is a huge area. And what Turkey wants to do is to uh, take a large number of the refugees from the 3.5 million refugees, largely Syrian Arabs, uh, in refugee camps on Turkish soil and to relocate them into these areas. Again, that is ethnic displacement, very mm -hmm. clearly. Uh, and again, the suddenness of this is what is, I think, the biggest 
and most prominent feature in what has led individuals like Senator McConnell and Senator Graham and others uh, and and folks like me to express res grave reservations about this. General Petrus, what's the logic? If you were to think and stretch your imagination and try to think, why on earth did this happen so suddenly, so abruptly? What what are the mechanisms that led to it? Is it really people who believe in that you know, theory of uh, things behind the scenes are talking about a certain deal between Trump and, uh, and Erdogan? Others are talking about you know, uh, uh, it's something deeper than what we have just witnessed. Um, what no, is, what look, is, I mean, I can't What is your feeling? Why, why, no, I, why? I don't even Can you theories. explain? Can you explain you, why? You go ahead and do it. <laughs> um, no, I mean, that, that's something for the administration to answer. It's not something I think that's helpful for a retired four-star to yeah. start speculating about what might be the... Look, I think, again, there are some very understandable desires here. There is an understandable desire to reduce the cost of endless wars, which is really what yeah. we're talking about, not ending, because you can't, again, necessarily end these endless wars. What you can do is reduce the cost uh, of these, um, there was a recognition of a legitimate Turkish security concern, as I described earlier, about the YPG relationship with the PKK. Um, and so I think those are all somewhat understandable. Uh, but again, why it happened on that particular Saturday or Sunday when that call was made uh, is something for the administration to answer. So let me discuss the angle of Russia in Syria, since we are still in Syria, we will be moving on to Iraq and other places, but uh, is Russia really the big winner at this point? Shall we just say, well, bravo, Putin, you did it, you got what you want, and especially my information is that as soon as uh, this development happened with the United States, with Pence um, being in Ankara and uh, the agreement uh, for the five-day ceasefire and what have you, my understanding is that Mr. Putin called Mr. Erdogan and said, we need to talk. And they did talk. And apparently, it, they cemented their gains in Syria. Is this something good that we say, well, we shouldn't worry about it, at least Syria is under control? Or should the U.S. really worry about uh, Putin being totally in charge together with Erdogan in Syria and we opted out? Well, I'm not one who regards Russia uh, or Iran, for that matter, uh, as friends of the United States. Uh, that doesn't mean we don't have some common interests in some cases. We actually do with each of those countries. Uh, it does mean that, by and large, they don't wish us well. Um, we understand that. And so it, I'm not one who was applauding uh, this very somewhat stunning photo and actually press conference uh, in which Vladimir Putin is sitting down with President Erdogan of Turkey and seems to be the arbiter uh, of how the situation is going to evolve in Syria. Uh, so again, I think and keep in mind, by the way, again, the individual they are supporting, uh, Bashar al-Assad, the president of Syria, is responsible for the deaths of over 500,000 of his own people. The UN stopped counting deaths. I mean, yes. they just gave up at 500,000 and That's said right. this is no longer a useful exercise. Uh, and responsible for the displacement of over half of his own population, half of that was displaced outside the country, and meant much of that then ended up in Europe, where it caused the biggest populist domestic challenges uh, in our NATO allies uh, in uh, Central and Western Europe. Uh, so again, this is not something that I applaud. Uh, and again, the sudden nature of this, I think, is the feature that is uh, as concerning as some of the implications of all of it. Before I, uh, I want to go to Iraq from Syria because this is a place that's dear to you all the time. But I want to understand that by with the, the news that said that there will be a, a bit of a return of American soldiers uh, their way back from Iraq, basically. It's, that story said that they were meant to go to Iraq, and for some reason, no, the decision was taken, well, no, they'll stay a little bit longer in Syria. 
Is well, what, I don't what do know you know what about the, that? No, I mean, I don't know anything about that. And again, those who do know about that have not been able to say mm. what the ultimate footprint what option will be selected for any kind of residual presence in Syria at this point in time. To my knowledge, that decision has not been made. Mm. Uh, the forces have apparently temporarily gone into Iraq. The Secretary of Defense was, of course, in Baghdad uh, today. Uh, and of course, that, you know, they're many hours ahead of us. Uh, and the agreement is that they'll stay in Iraq a month or so, um, and then either come home or who knows what. But um, again, that reflects a, a degree to which this was a largely uncoordinated, not a deliberate, well-planned, phased withdrawal, but a race for the exits. So the impression, which is really a wrong impression, is that the U.S. is withdrawing its forces from the uh, um, Arab region, from well, the that East, of course is completely which is wrong. Completely wrong, exactly. There Can have you been explain about that? Fourteen thousand yes. troops, exactly. U.S. Uh, soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines. During the same period, over a number of months, about fourteen thousand or so, more than that, have been added to the Gulf states, um, with the reintroduction into Saudi Arabia, the first of, that I'm aware of in a non-training or assistance presence. Uh, for a number of years. So that is a fairly significant augmentation. Of course, that is focused on providing better air and ballistic missile defenses, uh, force protection, and a variety of other tasks uh, for our own bases and for the important bases and infrastructure of our Gulf state partners. So it's pretty clear that we still have very significant national security interests uh, particularly, of course, the free flow of energy resources from the Gulf, which, although we depend on it vastly less than we did in the past, is still what fuels the global economy, mm -hmm. and that does uh, still have, again, very important security uh, dimensions for us. I, if I understood uh, what uh, General McKenzie said earlier. Uh, I think this is meant to be a deterrent to Iran, amongst other things. Well, it is a deterrent. If deterrence fails, it is a defense. If defense uh, is required, it also provides some uh, counter uh, opportunities as well. Uh, In light of the new uh, lack of clarity, or lack of a uh, maybe it, it became de facto um, a situation where you don't define what is your security arrangement with your partners. Okay, it's clear within the security arrangement with Israel, Israel is an ally of the United States. It's, it's a different category. But there's a new definition now, or at least lack of a definition, uh, of what does the security arrangement or security pact with the Gulf Arab states mean? What are the limits? I mean, we know that when Aramco headquarters were, or Aramco facilities were hit, everybody said just like lie low, don't don't go the distance. So well, is, there it, actions, is there? Uh, there were actions taken, to be fair. Uh, Which there are were cyber sanctions. actions and there were also sanctions. These are not trivial. That's right. But it is certainly not the kind of kinetic response that certainly many might have uh, expected. Look, again, to be fair, I think there has been a lesson learned that be wary of establishing red lines mm -hmm. unless you truly mean it. Mm -hmm. uh, because if you have a red line, that is established publicly, and then it turns out that, well, we really didn't mean that, that erodes the confidence uh, in your reliability very significantly. We obviously experienced that when it came to the Syrian use of chemical weapons. Uh, this particular administration did actually use force twice on Syria, in a measured, prompt way, uh, in the wake of Syrians using chemical weapons once again, uh, very clearly. Uh, but I think it is fair to uh, assert what you are, uh, that, the, there, that there's a lack of specificity in a couple of different ways. One is, uh, I think, what truly are U.S. objectives when it comes to the Iran nuclear program? You know, what specifically about that Iran nuclear agreement was not sufficient? Uh, that we want to negotiate further on that, presumably the sunset clauses, the ends of some of the different elements of that. Specifically, what does 
Iranian uh, agreement to the non-proliferation treaty, the additional protocol of that mean? Uh, what are our specific objectives relative to the Iranian missile program and then to the malign activity as it's described, this Iranian support for Shia militias and the desire to Lebanonize Iraq in the same way that they have Lebanonized uh, Lebanon. And by that I mean that you establish a very powerful militia. It's controlled by Iranian funded trained, equipped, and, and, and to, to a considerable degree controlled by the Iranian Revolutionary Guards Corps uh, Quds Force. Uh, and in addition to that, you have very substantial influence in the parliament. And in fact, in Lebanon, the Hezbollah, if you will, the, the grouping of, of those who will vote with Hezbollah can actually veto anything they don't like. But, I mean, you're the Lebanese, you're yeah. the Beiruti, the Beirut <laughs> incident we inc yeah, had. Yes. I, but, and that's an unfortunate reality. They would love to do the same in Iraq. They'd, they, and they do have some Iranian-supported Shia militia. Not all Shia militia are supported by Iran. Not all agree with Iran. There are other militia that are not supported by Iran, and obviously the Iraqi security forces are not. Uh, but again, they'd love to have a real amount of considerable power on the ground the way they do in Lebanon, and they would love to have the control in the parliament that they also have in, in Lebanon. Uh, they'd like to do the same in Syria. Gosh, if they could do it in Yemen, they'd probably yeah. do that there as well. So, Well, well maybe there's an concerns. opportunity in Lebanon now to take another look at what's happening, maybe, in order, maybe with the potential of putting a stick in well, that there are wheel. serious challenges because there, right as you now, well know. yeah, right now, yeah. Uh, when people are on the streets in Lebanon, they're yep. coming out to say that that arrangement, that abnormal situation, cannot be sustained. Not only because the, of what Hezbollah has done, but also because of those who provided the political cover to Hezbollah, such as the president and his party and the foreign minister, and such as also the prime minister. And when when they got into this arrangement that uh, allowed Hezbollah to say, I shall continue to be in control and you're going to have to give me the political cover and, and every other cover, even when I'm under sanctions. So maybe that, that prototype may be changed because of the challenge coming from a million point seven uh, uh, people on the streets. In, inshallah. But may I remind you, the bigger challenge for Lebanon, which is often overlooked, uh, and it's even bigger than the corruption and the malfeasance and the terrible bureaucratic inefficiency and inadequate basic services and all the rest of that. Mm. The real issue in Lebanon that, again, is very inadequately recognized is the inability of the central bank of, Re of Lebanon. This is an institution, I think it's only had two central bank, what is it, governors or presidents governors. in the last... 30 years, and mm. they have been universally respected. I mean, the one, the previous one, not the current one, the previous one used to sleep in the central bank headquarters because it that. was in the Hezbollah area of town. <laughs> yes, he was yes. not from it. His mm -hmm. wife would bring him once a week mm. all the pre-cooked meals. <laughs> uh, this is a true patriot. Mm, mm -hmm. And he was a genius when it came to financial uh, schemes or ideas to patch up and to undergird uh, the challenges that Lebanon has had, certainly for decades, when it comes to the finances. The problem now is that despite the skill of the current governor, and again, I think it's fair to say a universally respected individual, uh, and they try to be very non-partisan, non-sectarian, etc., <coughs> despite that, they're just running out of the capacity uh, again, to continue to plug holes in the dike financially, and that is a very, very serious development because that means that the the debt that has been accumulating during all this time is something that is now overwhelming the capacity of the most creative central bank in the world, arguably, mm -hmm. uh, or among them, yeah. uh, to to backstop those. And that is going, mark my words, that will actually be the more significant challenge uh, because at a certain point in time, the banks of Lebanon are no longer going to be able to perform their functions. The cost of money will go up. You all know what happens 
and that at a certain unless point what in time, happens, this, this becomes unsustainable. Unless what happens? I, again, you are the Beiruti, not me. You are the, the what is it called? No, the uh, Lebnuni. Lebnania. Uh, Lebnania. Um, I, I do not see a path out of this particular wilderness, I'm afraid. Uh, certainly it would be wonderful <clears throat> if there could be a reduction in the corruption and improvement in basic services, so agreement to actually pass legislation, um, reminding you that that's not the only capital in the world where com compromise is a bit of a dirty word. But, yeah, but you, uh, when you see 1.7 million people on yep. the streets, uh, crying out against corruption, against the the, the ruling uh, elite that have uh, you know, coupled their good wishes with Hezbollah uh, and otherwise, and but just they lied low, and then there is 1.7 million people on for the seventh day on the street saying, "No, you won't." You think this is in, in, irrelevant? Well, the the question is: Are the structural deficiencies? These are not temporal. These are, you know, hard that have accumulated over a period, considerable period of time, are these structural deficiencies and distortions, you know, an economics professor would talk about mm. distortions, subsidies for, you know, you fill in the blank, because many different goods and services are subsidized, um, are those so embedded in the economy that you cannot eliminate those distortions without even greater unrest uh, in which case you're in a very serious situation. And by no means is Lebanon the only country in that kind of situation. Yeah, Hezbollah, amongst others, is very nervous about what's going on, the leadership of They should be very nervous about what's going on, but frankly, so should the other political leaders Indeed. Uh, in Lebanon, not the least of which is my friend Saad Hariri. Mm. Let me tie it exactly directly to the uh, revolutionary guards in Tehran who are very much in control or in uh, cahoot with whatever Hezbollah is doing in Lebanon. But um, don't have the resources to underwrite Hezbollah the way they used to because so, okay. of the sanctions and the fall in the price of oil. Therefore, and, and equal, the, therefore so the situation are leads challenged to... challenged as well. All right, so then let me just build on this point because that's very important. Would there be an opportunity now because of the sanctions imposed on Iran and on Hezbollah to make a difference in uh, the pr project of Iran to have the prototype of Hezbollah in other places? I mean, remember that this is their success story. Uh, the regime in Tehran, uh, think of Hezbollah is. Uh, as their success story. Is it an opportune time now to <clears throat> think out of the box and see if you could dent that? Certainly, um, but I'm not sure that I see the inclination to do that, unfortunately. Inclination for whom? Well, uh, most of the Western countries of the world are not increasing their equivalent of the Agency for International Development funding. Uh, to be fair, this in this country we are doubling the amount that's available in what is now called the uh, International Development Finance Corporation, and that's a very significant initiative, obviously Congress uh, enabling that. Uh, but if you've watched our budgets for the State Department and AID in recent years, they have been going down, not up, despite the heroic efforts of people, again, like Lindsey Graham, who happens to be on the Appropriations Subcommittee uh, that oversees that. And that means, and this is, you know, the point that Jim Mattis used to make, you know, if you don't send me diplomats or development dollars, you're going to have to send me more ammunition. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, again, keep in mind, as you all well know, uh, so many of you have so much in-depth knowledge on these issues, the military can establish a security footprint or a security foundation. But what solidifies that foundation is the work that is done on top of that. It is the restoration of basic services. It's the repair of, of damaged infrastructure. It's the reestablishment of local markets, schools, health clinics, ultimately the rule of law, local dispute mechanisms, local governance, political reconciliation, all of these. But those are enabled by individuals other than those in uniform. And the budgets for those entities have, again, at the best been, for, been flat uh, more likely have been gradually going down. Back to the sanctions policy in Iran in itself. Okay. As you are well aware, there has been reports that they are really hurting. And what we heard when no, we were at is, the summit... In, this is, in, you know, again, these are indisputable facts. Right. The, the economy so, has gone like that. 
Um, the currency has gone like that. Inflation has gone like that, and unemployment has gone like that. So we have quite effectively, through the maximum pressure campaign, put Iran in a box in a corner. Right. So much so that they feel that they can do nothing but lash out. So, and that is what they've been doing, trying to feel the edges to make sure they don't do something that uh, causes a response. But so what are the we're lines in a of little bit of a out. box too. General, what uh, are we're going to have to get back to the table at the end of the day, and that I think is what what will ultimately happen. And then, as I mentioned earlier, then you can sit down and discuss the issues about the nuclear agreement that are truly not acceptable. Keep in mind, by the way, and again, I never ended up taking a position on the agreement, uh, but there are some very positive features to that. All the medium enriched uranium was eliminated. 99% of the low enriched uranium was el eliminated. The number of centrifuges spinning was cut in half. The deeply buried, hardened site at near Fordo uh, was turned into a research facility. The plutonium path to a bomb was ended with cement poured into the reactor core, and we have a reasonably intrusive set uh, of inspection regimes. Yes, it gave them 45 or 50 billion dollars that was frozen around the world, much of which had claims against it already. Yes, it seemed to promise a return to the global economy, which was very attractive to them, never fully realized because there was the threat of sanctions pretty early on. And, and then with the reimposition of sanctions, of course, that has limited very dramatically, including even Chinese mm -hmm. firms, mm -hmm. not just European ones. Yeah, you're going to have to work with me, General, because I guess we have 10 minutes and I've got 100 questions for you in these 10 minutes. So one, two, three. You have to talk less about your home country then. No, I, no that's not true. That's not fair. That's not fair. That's really not fair. But. Uh, <laughs> it's just a joke, right? I know, place. dear. I know. <laughs> uh, Say the doctora. <laughs> <laughs> Say the doctor. Let <laughs> me focus on what's next in in terms of Iran. The message from the Iranians is that they're not going to sit and talk unless san partial sanctions are lifted. It's limited, some uh, somebody called it a limited buyout that should be offered. Which to I them. think is probably what eventually is going to happen. The when? question is how when? do you get to it? It's going to be a result of some back-channel negotiation, whether it's, again, through the Swiss, through the uh, <coughs> Japanese, through yeah. the Omanis who facilitated so, the last one. But at some point in time, look, we need to go back let to me, the let, no, I, well. I just need to, to, to get a couple of points here to understand if you agree with them or not. So you, the, the message from the Iranian leadership, at least from the Revolutionary Guards, is that we're not going to change. We have our project, we have our raison d'etre, including that we're not going to be satisfied by being within our borders. It is our right to be an expansionist because this is the logic of our regime. They're saying that. And they're saying that despite that, what you need to do is lift uh, partially the sanctions, uh, let us sell our oil, and then we can talk about it. Are you, do you support uh, responding to the, um, you know, sort of what looks to some as a blackmail from Iran uh, from, with, with, with bowing to their demands and giving them the mm, sanction relief? No, as, or do as you I think said, we should really stay the course with the sanctions until there's a change in their you know, m uh, per perception? Because they are hurting and they're telling us by mid-November they're going to have to do something bigger than what they've done to show their strengths. What I have said is that we should be very clear about what our objectives are relative to the nuclear agreement or nuclear program, the missile program, and the malign activity. Mm. Uh, and then we should get back to the table. We will probably have to lift some of the sanctions to <coughs> enable that, then discuss those issues uh, and get the best deal that we can to achieve the objectives that we have relative to those three. But by the way, I, I should point out, again, were I the Central Command Commander or CIA Director, I would be asking, can you give us more specificity on each of these items? Mm. Again, to say that this is the worst deal in history is not sufficiently precise if you're going to try to remedy what it is that gives you that kind of concern. What is it specifically? Let's get to that. And then let's put that on the table and let's try to negotiate that and get assurances. Again, I can understand that the 
sunset clauses and some of these elements might mm -hmm. matter. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is a legitimate reason to sit down and discuss this further. There's a lot of other, you know, fine points but, but that you want to but, get but, into. But, but, a lot of times we see that there is focus on the nuclear and the ballistic missiles. This is why I specifically with, said the malign activity. That's right. Uh, should that well be equally the, on the, the table? Program. This is the three leg of the table that should be all together, you know, approach, or should there be an approach that we just do the nuclear first and then the ballistic, and then we can see later. Like, you know, like, no, I tend to think that you probably have to get all three on the table. Because, okay. I mean, at the end of the day, I think it is legitimate to say that we, there was a sense that if a deal was done on the nuclear program, and as I mentioned, there are a lot of positive elements to that deal. Mm -hmm. um, if that was done, that that might usher in a relationship where we could then address the missile program and the malign activity. Uh, and that, in a sense, Iran would become a more responsible, would become a stakeholder, and it would reduce some of the activity that has been so concerning uh, to the countries in the region and to most most other countries in the world. I uh, want your views uh, on what uh, what I understood General McKenzie to have said a bit earlier, that the priority really is to look at what China and Russia are doing in the region and building on our weaknesses so that they could accomplish their own gains. Uh, what, how, well, that's how certainly one of the things that we yeah. should be doing. Obviously, there are many, many activities that we should be pursuing in the Middle East and around the world. And again, we, you know, in fact, when I was a Central Command commander, people used to ask me, so what is it like to be the Central Command commander? And I used to say, you know that guy, and little guy in the circus, and he puts a plate on a stick and he gets it spinning, 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 and then he goes over and gets another one up, and he, you know, sooner or later he's got 10 or 15 plates. You know, there's some plates that are bigger than others, and you don't let those drop. Um, but that's what the Central Command Commander does. He is a plate spinner. And again, these different plates, there are numerous of them. Among those certainly are those that have to do with Iran, with the Islamic State, with other Islamist extremist organizations, uh, with instability, with ethno and sectarian uh, violence, with humanitarian issues, with, again, it keeps going on, and, and certainly, uh, activities of China where they are contrary to our objectives would be among those. But let's note that often China has similar objectives. They also want to see the continued freedom of navigation in the Gulf that allows the free flow of resources uh, to them and also to their customers and trading partners uh, elsewhere in Asia and in Europe. We had Chinese ships sailing with us in the counter piracy program off Somalia. Do you see it they happening now? They would never be part of the coalition, <clears throat> but that didn't matter because we had ship bridge to bridge communications and they worked in and actually essentially, unofficially, uh, were contributing to the effort against pirates. So again, I think. So you think this is happening now or it's a potential of this happening now? that the Chinese will come in They're not to going to join a U.S.-led yes, maritime understood. coalition. Yeah. Japan didn't, what, doesn't agree to join that, but they will all work together. Mm -hmm. And I think that is the key. And, and this is always, what is the art of the possible when it comes to foreign policy and security policy? Uh, and then, look, and a coalition commander, by the way, even in a coalition, you know, I commanded the largest fighting coalition, I think, in the world, where people actually on the ground uh, fighting uh, insurgents and terrorists in Afghanistan, because uh, Iraq was somewhere 30 to 35 countries, Afghanistan was over 60. Uh, every single one of those countries, except for the United States, had some caveats, had some limitations on the ways its forces could be used. So it is not uncommon to have coalition partners, to have allies who actually don't give you complete use of their forces. In Bosnia, where I was a one-star and the head of operations for the NATO Stabilization Force, I literally had to have a matrix on my desk to remind me which countries would not do which tasks. Mm -hmm. And so then you have to compensate for them uh, with those that are willing to take those tasks. China and other countries are more extreme. Uh, you know, they have real serious caveats in that they won't join the coalition. But that doesn't mean that, again, they can't contribute to the overall objective that is their desired objective and happens to be ours as well. By the way, we have similar objectives in combating Islamist extremists. We have that with Russia as well. We have it presumably with 
issues like climate change and, and others. But even the Europeans are objecting to the U.S. leadership of such a... Uh, if, um, I don't think they're objecting to it. Uh, the Germans they, they, were. Some have been slow to join it. But again, welcome to coalitions. Look, I realized one time coalition maintenance and sustainment is a really frustrating and time-consuming task. Uh, and I realized one time that I was meeting with a particular prime minister who was, I was giving him more minutes than he was giving us individual soldiers. You know, get over it. Churchill was right when he said that the only thing worse than fighting with allies is fighting without them. Um, and again, uh, so I strongly believe in coalitions, but I'd go at it very clear-eyed, knowing that every single country in that coalition probably has some restriction, um, except for the United States, and you're going to compensate, uh, you're going to augment uh, where there are shortcomings, you're going to compensate with U.S. capabilities or other country capabilities. And my last question to you, General, what do you do about the erosion of confidence and trust in the United States? That, the, that reputation sure. of uh, that, that the Americans will always drop you in the middle of the road or otherwise called the legacy of betrayal. What do you do about that, especially with friends uh, who are thinking differently now, who are thinking together well, think with is, Russia and China, they are receiving very, them. Very legitimate uh, question. So they're looking to I Russia remember, and China. So what do you do to, in is, order to regain is, the confidence? This is personal for me, albeit with the Iraqi Kurds, not the Syrian Kurds. But I remember as a two-star general, after we did the fight to Baghdad and 101st Airborne Division <clears> went <throat> north to Mosul and Nainua province, we were also responsible for the three provinces of the Kurdish regional government. They were doing fine on their own, but we still had a variety of uh, interactions and activities, and actually we helped them build their two now international airports uh, at the time. But I remember going up there the very first time I went, met with uh, Masoud Barzani, the president of the KRG at the time, Kak Masoud, uh, incredible war hero. By the way, we would go once a month and somewhere up in the mountains, we would fly the helicopter up, just land wherever they told us. And then he and I would sit in a tent with the side open looking into the valley, and he would tell me about the battles he had fought in that valley. Just the two of us eating great Iraqi Kurdish food, two soldiers talking war stories, uh, and then we would get on to the issues of the day. The first meeting that we had, he said, General, there's one thing you should understand about the Kurds. And I said, what is that, Mr. President? And he said, the Kurds have no friends but the mountains. Mm. And I said, Mr. President, that is wrong. The Americans are your friends. And I did remind him, in fact, we have protected must be the Kurdish region, words. region uh, since the uh, Operation Northern Watch was begun in the wake of the Gulf War. We have been there for you during that. We are here with you now. And again, we are your friends. And, and you have other friends than the mountains. And obviously, those words came back to me this past week, needless mm -hmm. to say. So what do you do? Well, you're going to have to reestablish uh, credibility. Uh, you're going to have to reestablish your reliability. Uh, and again, that can take some time. Uh, but as all, you know, with all long, long roads begin with a single step, and we've got to start right initially with figuring out what can we do to take care of those who enabled the defeat, who's, who actually did defeat on the ground at the loss of over 10,000 of their lives, mm -hmm. the Islamic State, uh, how do we help them now that they, in some cases, are having to leave their homes with their families? Uh, and then how do we re retrieve or salvage what is possible in line with what Senator McConnell is pursuing on Capitol Hill mm -hmm. uh, with the legislation that would uh, cause, a, again, a rethink of some elements of this particular withdrawal decision. General Petraeus, never a dull moment in a conversation with you, so thank <laughs> you very much. Always <laughs> Thank you so much. Shukran Jazeelan.